guess it's zero when we have to start. Well, good morning. Uh, good to be able to be here and talk a little bit about um, our multiplication strategy and thoughts on multiplication in regards to global missions. Last time we got together, we talked about the local outreach that leads to multiplication and uh, primarily within church planting and how we as a church desire to be one who multiplies in church planting locally and as well as sending missionaries to plant churches globally. So um, it's all about expanding, seeing God's kingdom expand in this world uh, through church planting and making disciples. So uh, today about global missions. So um, for our look today, we're going to dive a little bit into uh, Romans 10, just a little bit of a portion of Romans 10, just to kind of see what Paul says. That kind of equates and talks a lot about how we are to uh, view global missions and what um, the why, the what, the how. Um, and then we are going to, let me see here. We're going to look a little bit into the, there we go. That comes it didn't flip to the next one. There we go. Um, we're going to look a little bit about why missions uh, in general. And then a little bit about what is missions in, in a general sense, uh, followed by how do we do missions in our churches and kind of, oh, there we go again, in a general sense. That's what we get for turning on fans and air conditioners and everything for the comfort. But since we're talking about missions, we should be in the blazing heat, no coffee, sitting outside underneath of a tree. Maybe that's what we should, be, should have uh, desired to do. Uh, but after how do we do missions in general in churches, we're going to look at a little bit about what our vision here is at Redeemer Church, pull out um, some thoughts that we're going to try to implement here as a church over the long haul, what we aspire to do for missions that are ch as a church. At least the lights are back on. So, I got a question for you first. What is the Great Commission? Okay. Has everyone heard of that before? The Great Commission, when I say Great Commission? Um, are there, where is it found usually in Scripture? Matthew 28, 18 to 20, sure. Is it found anywhere else? Parts of it? Some of it? Acts? We're in Acts? Acts 1, 8, sometimes people point to that, where God said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. Other parts, maybe? Every one of the Gospels touches upon a piece of the Great Commission, although we classically will turn to Matthew 28. Mark 16, 15, there's a piece there. Luke 24, 47 to 48. Even John 20, 21, where Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. That there is this aspect of being sent. But why did I say, what is the Great Commission? Well, here is some data from uh, Barna. Barna has done a lot of analysis of... Um, churches and uh, Christianity and church work in primarily in North America. But in a study that they did, 51% of churchgoers in the States had no clue about the Great Commission. No clue. Didn't even know what it was. Didn't even know the term. Furthermore, 85% of pastors that they surveyed said that missions is a mandate for all Christians. Whereas, only 25% of all Christians agree. So only a quarter of those who surveyed said, yeah, the Great Commission is for everyone. So it doesn't mean that all of us are called to go overseas. 
That doesn't mean that. But it certainly does not mean that we are to be uncaring, idle, uh, unloving, or ignoring the mandate that Christ gave to, to go, to make disciples of all people, of all nations. So that is our mandate, is the Great Commission. So let's talk a little bit, talk a little bit about why missions? Why missions? Somebody want to read these verses here for us? Matthew, or sorry, Romans 10, 4 through 8. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Okay, so often uh, we, we start kind of, in your Bibles, there's a section, usually there's a section break at verse 5. But if you look back there at verse 4, which we have here, uh, he talks about the importance of Christ um, in regards to uh, Christ being the end of the law. So uh, one commentator actually said that we could view this as kind of like a race, uh, the end of a race. The end of the race is not only the, the goal of the race to get to the end, the finish line that is, um, but it's also... Um, literally the end. So Christ is the end of the law, bringing its reign or error to close, and it's the goal of what the law was ultimately pointing towards. It's not that Jesus canceled the law and said, hey, don't worry about it anymore. He, did not, he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so that's what we are seeing here that Paul is talking about in verse 4. But then in verses 5 through 8, Paul lays out uh, this contrast of righteousness by law and righteousness by faith. Um, many, if not all, other religions in this world are all about works. How can we attain to deity, Godhead, some sort of upper being, greater being, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, they all point to this, us trying to do some kind of work to get towards God. Whereas in Christianity, it's a complete opposite. God came to us and said, the only way you can come to me is by the work that I must do on your behalf. So there's a huge difference between what we see in the two. Um, So we do not have a, a hopeless faith, but a faith based in hope in Christ. So this should be our impetus for evangelism and for missions, is that we have the good news of Jesus Christ, that we have this message where God has come to us, that God has uh, made it possible for us to come to him, and we don't have to work for that. Um, Yes, we do things, but we don't have to work for our salvation. We serve a God who has come to us, as in, again, John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, meaning Jesus, even so I am sending you. So that is the good news that we have, but let me point out why missions is important. Because, well, the word population is about 8 billion people, give or take. It's constantly growing, so we don't really know precisely, and which is amazing, because I think when I was in high school, it was 4 billion. So it is growing a lot. So roughly 4 billion, uh, sorry, 8 billion people. However, about 155,000 people die every day without the hope of Jesus Christ. Roughly two people every second are dying without the hope of Jesus Christ. 
That is uh, from some statistics from the International Mission Board, which is the missions arm of the Southern Baptist um, Conference. Now, there's another statistic here. 17, 000, there's roughly 17,313 distinct people groups in this world. Now, what do I mean by a people group? It's basically a group of people um, defined by some sort of ethno-linguistic or geographic area. So maybe a group of people living in a, an island in Indonesia or a group of people um, isolated in parts of India. Actually, a lot of these people groups are found in a lot of parts of Asia. So 17,313 people groups in the world. However, roughly 7,278 of them, and this number kind of fluctuates depending on what numbers you're looking at, are considered unreached. That's roughly 3.2 billion people, or one-third of the world's population, has no clue who Jesus Christ is. Now, they are considered unreached for varying reasons. They are either they're living in a geographic area that's very difficult for foreigners to get to. The linguistic barriers are difficult to cross, um, culturally difficult to cross. Or the government is hostile to allowing any sort of uh, influence come to them. Or, let's just face it, the enemy is highly opposed to the gospel getting to those people. So they are considered unreached for varying reasons. And again, a lot of those people groups are in the Asian area, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, India, the former area where a lot of wars were happening, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, a lot of that area is where a lot of these unreached people are. They have no access to the gospel. Um, Christ, again, is largely unknown, and the church that is closest to them doesn't have the resources to send people to them. Now, there are also some statistics that about 425,000 missionaries are in the world. I don't know precisely how many of those are North Americans versus from other countries, but roughly 425,000 missionaries in the world. 77% of work of them working among those that are reached, saved. So perhaps going to, for instance, we went to Czech Republic. That is not an unreached people group. There is a thriving church in Czech. Now, granted, it's less than half of 1% would be evangelical Christian, but if you wanted to hear the gospel, there is opportunity for a Czech to hear the gospel. That would not be an unreached people group. But 77% of workers of these 425,000 are working in areas where the gospel is accessible to people, easily accessible to people. Roughly... 3% work among those who have no access. So there's about 3% of those missionaries are working amongst a third of the world. That's why we need missions. Um, again, that's not be to say that all of us here in this room are going to be called to parts of India and Indonesia and Southeast Asia to go work among those unreached. But it should cause us to pray. It should cause us to um, mobilize friends. Uh, it should cause us to mobilize family members, perhaps, that are growing up that might want to go into missions. And perhaps it's super exciting to maybe go to Ireland and minister there, but let's lay on their heart to go to parts of the world that have zero access to the gospel. I understand the difficulty in going to those places. It is hard. It's not an easy place to minister to. It's not an easy place to get to. But still, if indeed we have the message of the gospel, we have the only message that people can um, have hope in, then it's important that we take the message to them. That's why missions is important. This is a quote from uh, Leslie Newbigin. Leslie Newbigin was a pastor, theologian in Great Britain, but he was mostly a missionary in India. And he said this, he said, Today's, this is a message for 
pastors and leaders, but I think it's applicable to us. Today's pastors in the West must re- relearn the skills of the missionary. We're no longer primarily chaplains to a Christianized culture or merely custodians of doctrine. We need more pastor missionaries. Um, you can probably just notice in our own culture that things have changed over the last 50 years, if you've been around that long, even in the last 10, things have changed drastically. Our culture is, is going at breakneck speed in ways that are opposite of God. The church, for instance, this building here was typical of America 100 years ago. That a new community was established, what well, was one of the first things that they did, they established a church in the middle of the community and everything kind of built up around it. Because church was a part of their culture, it was ingrained in the culture, people lived a Christian life, maybe not all were evangelical Christian, as we might say, but they lived a Christian life. It was part of their culture. Things have changed and changed and changed and changed and changed. And before you know it, the church is like, we no longer look like the culture. They no longer look like us. And so we as a culture here in the West need to relearn the skills of a missionary. Those who are going to India and Indonesia pick up understanding how to engage with a culture that's hostile to Christianity, that those are skill sets that we as not only leaders in the church, but as others in the church as well, need to understand and and figure out, well, how would a missionary engage with this culture? Because this culture is hostile to the gospel. So it's important for us, even in our culture, to understand and grow and learn in missions and missionary skills. Any thoughts on the why before I move on to what? No problem. The what of missions. Let's take a look at the next part of Romans 10. Somebody want to read that for us? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. Showing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay. So some of the uh, what has been mentioned in the why. Um, we see in this passage, though, that the chief aim or goal is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, our desire should be to see lives transformed in Christ. Um, to see the, the dead come to life. Paul says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It's a simple message. It's a simple message, but yet one that is challenging in this world, in a world that does not desire God. But that is what missions is about, is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. A few more things to consider about the what. Um, this is not just a message for the Jew, as Paul was pointing out, Jew and Gentile, like we're, we're all Gentile, by the way, in case you didn't realize it, unless you have Jewish heritage. Um, this is a message for more than just North Americans. This is a message for Peruvians, Brazilians, Zimbabweans, Chinese, French, uh, Indonesian, Papuan, a message for the world and not just for a select group of people and we don't get to decide who gets to hear um, that's that's God's business he wants us to to spread the gospel to all to all um, the work is doing an injustice to them as well if all we ever focus in on is humanitarian work. So what has been transpiring a little bit in 
the missions world, I don't know, maybe over the last uh, 20 or so years with a, with a newer generation coming in, uh, the millennial and Gen Z generations are a little bit more about wanting to see impact in certain specific ways. So there are a lot of um, work being, there's a lot of work being done in project kind of based work. Like I would really want to go make an impact in this society by drilling wells in Africa where there's no good water or going to work in an orphanage in whatever part of the country world uh, or going to do community development in parts of the world that the community is needing help with sustainable farming, let's say. So there's a, that's great work, but the shift has been away from disciple making and church planting to more of this charitable humanitarian work to the neglect of the gospel. Not across the board. And don't get me wrong, it's not that that work is bad. It is good work. But let's remember what Jesus said. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He did not come to feed 5,000 with bread and fish. He did not come to simply turn water into wine so that a wedding could be having a fantastic celebration. He did not come simply to heal. He did not come to simply um, make the deaf hear and the blind see. He came to seek and save the lost. And if that was what Jesus' mission was, that should be the church's mission as well. It's a great quote here from uh, D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson, very well-known theologian and author, said this, at one time, holistic ministry was an expression intended to move Christians beyond proclamation to include deeds of mercy. Increasingly, however, holistic ministry refers to deeds of mercy without any proclamation of the gospel. And that is not holistic. It's not even halfistic. Since the deeds of mercy are not the gospel, they are entailments of the gospel. Halfistic, of course, is not a word, but is it my English major? <laughs> what do you think of that statement? Sure. Helping with clean water, like not neglecting the clean water or the, the basic necessities of life. Yes. I feel like it's also like, um, I don't know, it's wrong just, just, just to proclaim the gospel if, if we're ignoring that other aspect. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think going back to the illustrations that you gave, like Jesus, he didn't come to feed the 5,000 or change the water to wine or heal, but he did those things. But then when he did those things, it was a doorway. You know, he, he would heal somebody, and then he would say, and the kingdom of God is like this. Right. I mean, Jesus did make it obvious that, you know, um, he said you can't just turn away your neighbor if he comes to you in need of something. That, that's wrong to just say, hey, God be with you, peace, and we'll see you tomorrow. Well, they may not have a tomorrow because they're dying of starvation. Um, and obviously, and those things could be an impediment for them to want to accept the gospel message. They're, they're in great need of water or food or care or love or shelter. That's their immediate need. And showing the love of God by meeting that need and then proclaiming the gospel as part of that is, is powerful. But they may need a roof over their head before they're going to be able to accept Jesus Christ and understand the message. Like, so, yeah, it's important to, to do both and not have the pendulum swing the opposite direction of we don't need it. Yeah, I, I just think that this quote shows the false dichotomy. Like, right, we set up this either-or kind of mentality between, like, are we doing humanitarian work? Are we doing gospel proclamation? And to his point, like, if you do the humanitarianism, 
without the gospel pro pro proclamation, you've lost the gospel. To the other side, if you do the gospel proclamation and let everyone have dirty water and dying and all this, there are hindrances to receiving the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Like, that doesn't sound like such good news because, like, yes, my soul is saved, but I'm miserable here. And so I, I think it's the same thing we think about it, even in how we minister to our neighbors and our family and all that, where there's a both end of like, well, I definitely want to help you in your situation, but I think it was D.L. Moody who said, you know, you can clothe the naked and feed the hungry and still send their souls to hell, mm -hmm. but then the flip side is also, you can also, it, is it really that loving to go and say, your soul is saved now, good luck dying of starvation on the mm -hmm. street, you know? So it, I just think it, there's a false dichotomy that's been set up that we just have to be able to go in and say, proclamation is the most important, but if we also lose the humanitarianism, then we've lost the gospel because mm -hmm. the gospel is a both and not a not either or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't humanitarianism part of the Absolutely, absolutely. There, our testimony comes through, and what people see. Um, was I'm not going to get the statement correct. It's something along the lines of people don't know how much you care until they see how much you care, something like that. So yeah, you can say your words. We're not helping in that way. They're not seeing Christ's love through us. Yeah. So it's important for us to. Proclaim the gospel, and if there are needs that are we see in front of us, it's it's a way, and it's, it's also a lot of times it's a bridge. I think Tim, you were saying that it's a bridge to be able to to come in and and be able to share the gospel with people, because one of the biggest obstacles as as a missionary going cross culturally somewhere is building trust. Um, they're not going to necessarily take your words just because oh wow you came to us and. Whatever you say goes, I guess I'll believe you. It's building trust with them. And part of that trust goes to seeing how much they know how much you care for them and what you're providing for them and helping them with. So a lot about building trust. Also some things about what the what is not. The what, yeah, more of what the what is not, yes. Um, That's not a word either. Yes, I know. Um, we need to make some kind of uh, level distinction of how we define this term missions. Uh, it's kind of had some difficulty being defined over the years, uh, especially right now where you have a lot of churches saying anything that we do outside of this building is missions. So everything that we do in outreach, everything we do in uh, just talking to my neighbor is all considered missions. But what that has done is kind of watered down this word missions over the years. And then one of the books I have over there talks a lot about this, is if everything is considered missions, then nothing is really considered missions. So we have lost kind of this term of missions. So that has happened actually a lot in, in North America, in, especially in the States in regards to churches where people can say, well, why do I need to go overseas? I'm a missionary. I'm, a, I'm doing missions already here because I talk to my neighbor. That's great. It's part of the Great Commission. You should be doing that. We should be sharing in many ways with our neighbors and with the community around us, which we do. But there's also this aspect of crossing a ethno-linguistic barrier. Um, There's a, a quote on what missions is, and uh, there's all these little books by Nine Marks. Um, we have some upstairs, but there's uh, these other hardback ones, and this, they're all small books on various aspects of the church. And this particular one was from their book on missions by Andy Johnson, and he writes about the definition of missions. The unique, deliberate gospel mission of the church to make disciples of all nations, evangelism that takes the gospel 
across ethnic, linguistic, and geographic boundaries that gathers churches and teaches them to obey everything Jesus commended. Not quite sure if that was commanded or commended. I don't know. Maybe I typed it in wrong. Um, but again, it's the aspect of taking what we are doing perhaps locally in outreach and evangelism and crossing some kind of ethno-linguistic cultural boundary. Now, that can at times be perhaps here in North America. There are some unreached groups actually in America. Um, not many, but there are. Uh, it could be going to a group of people. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you know this, but one of the very large, large unreached groups of people in a lot of cultures are those that are deaf. Um, so deaf ministry is a huge, huge need um, because not only, not only do you have that 3% that are working among the unreached, but it's probably a very small fraction of them that actually know sign language to be able to speak to those who are deaf. So that is... If you know sign language or have a desire for sign language, there's probably a job for you in missions somewhere. So uh, just so you know, it doesn't have to necessarily mean crossing a geographic boundary, um, but in all likelihood, it does mean crossing a geographic boundary in terms of going to a different country. We should also define the uh, term missionary uh, too often you've heard the word, again, like I said, it is, everyone is a missionary. Every single person, you're all ordained as missionaries. Go and be a missionary in the world. Again, I understand the intent that um, leaders of churches have when they say that, that they want people to have this idea, this mindset that we are called to go into the world and preach the gospel. Uh, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our friends, to our family. Uh, I get that, I understand that, but again, it gets back to the term of missions. If everything is missions, then nothing is really missions. If everyone is a missionary, then why should I go anywhere beyond my house in Berks County? Sure, sure. He does. That's what I would believe. Right. Right. So Andy Johnson defines missionary again in his book. Someone identified and sent out by local churches to make the gospel known and to gather, serve, and strengthen local churches across ethnic, linguistic, or geographic divides. Again, um, I think there's some important terms in there sent out by local churches. Uh, I am a proponent of mission agencies. I think there's strong need for mission agencies, but it's not the agency that sends missionaries, it's the church. So if the church is raising those people up, they're the ones who are sending them out with the help of an agency that has the know-how of how to cross those linguistic barriers, the training, the, the member care support for when those people are on the field. Uh, so the agencies can provide all that, but it's the church, Lord willing, one day this church, sending out people who have grown up in our church to go as missionaries. And it would be this church who sends them. Actually, tomorrow we have the privilege of sending, commissioning our short-term missions team uh, to Jamaica this summer and we are commissioning them to go. It's not, we are partnering with Teams for Medical Missions for this. It's not Teams for Medical Missions who is sending us. It's Redeemer Bible Fellowship who is sending the nine to go. So it is churches that send them. And it's also being sent to make disciples and strengthen and plant churches across the globe. Whether that's through humanitarian work that a church comes out of, um, or, or, some, or just going in classically and planting a church like we did here in Topton. Um, I do know of a, a missionary in La Paz, Mexico, who has a very um, interesting 
uh, ministry. And uh, I don't know if you know where La Paz, Mexico is. It's in the Baja Peninsula. It's about two hours north of Cabo San Lucas. Very, 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 very beautiful area of the world. His ministry is kayaking and scuba diving. Um, but through this, they, part of what they do is in scuba diving is they go out and they, they clean up the – somebody want to kill that centipede that's going around there? Didn't want that to crawl up anyone's leg. <laughs> um, they go out scuba diving and they clean up the coral reefs of all pollution and trash and things. And as a result, he's, he's reaching people that would never darken the door of a church, um, but have an interest in doing this. And he has been able to spend a lot of time because you're out in a boat, you're out in the ocean, in kayaking, you're out several hours, captive audience. Um, and he is sharing the gospel with these people, and he is seeing a church form as a result of this. So he's doing that humanitarian and gospel work as a result of that. So some fantastic work of just planting churches, but it's all about proclamation of the gospel in conjunction with helping the people in areas that are of need. So missions and missionaries. Any Thoughts on the what before we jump into a how? I don't expect you to have the answer to a thing that obviously is still a struggle for a lot of organizations and whatnot. But what would you call, what do we call those who are fundraised, supported to go and do work in the States? Yeah. You know I'm 100% aligned with what you're saying, um, but you have the BFC calling church plants missionary, church planters missionaries. You know, it just met with Sarah Stone, and they call their campus uh, ministers, they call them missionaries with disciple makers and crew and university and all these places. And so, not that you need to come up with a new term for something that no one's come up with yet, but... What do we call them? I mean, I agree with Sarah. You know, this is our it's discipleship, right? It's evangelism. There's other words we could use, but what do you call the person who's going to the college campus and doing ministry, but is being support raised? And, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the BSC changed their terminology a few years ago, and um, I'm not necessarily in agreement with how they changed their terminology. I will just simply say that if your agency is going to call you a missionary, there really is no need for us to sit here and squabble over that. Um, I think the, the answer to the missions problem is not necessarily do we call someone a missionary or this missions. The answer to the problem is telling people the need is in those unreached people groups. The need is elsewhere in this world and trying to promote, encourage, push, <laughs> persuade people to that work. Um, but if your agency is going to call you a missionary, fine. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and squabble over it. I, don't think, I think we're just parsing words at that point. For instance, the work that you were doing uh, as a church planter, call you a church planter. Wouldn't necessarily call you a missionary. Call you maybe a, goal, a gospel worker. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call that a missionary. Now, if the BFC is going to change its terminology and say church planners are missionaries, again, I'm not going to sit here and squabble over it. I think it's just wasting my breath over something that doesn't need to be wasted. But I will only ever call missionaries those who are going crossing linguistic, ethnic, cultural, geographic boundaries. That's what I would call a missionary. Um, but again, if someone's working for disciple makers or whatever, I'm their agency is going to call them a missionary. I'm not going to argue against it. That's fine. You know, people that are here in the States doing what we just discussed might then in turn one day go to a country. Absolutely. So this is a Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And that's important to know. And, and again, it's not to 
at all elevate crossing a cultural boundary as more important than doing work here in the States. Who am I to sit here and say that, that God was wrong in calling you to work here in the States and he should have called you over there? I, I'm not God. I can't, I can't discern what, how God has led that person to work here in the States versus going overseas. Um, I will only say that we should be promoting the need where the needs, where the great needs are and allow the Holy Spirit to work in someone's heart to say, you should go here versus there versus there. Um, so it's all important work. It's all part of the God. It's all part of gospel ministry. Um, Yep. and unreached people that actually do end up in the college campus that we may be the first touch for them and they do, like college campuses do go out to other countries, they have their own yep. you know, trips that we send people all the time out to Spain out to, now that's not necessarily unreached, but they do have trips um, like the archaeology department goes to unreached areas. And so it might start there. It's sort of like a forward rolling train, I guess you could say. Like it starts maybe with the missionaries that are on the college campus, but well, you know, missionaries mm -hmm. that are on the college campus, but then like it reaches out to those areas where they're going. Not necessarily maybe always a hundred percent for that particular spreading the gospel from the university's perspective, but still, those people are going out to what you Yeah, there is, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of campus ministry, not only is just generalized campus ministry of reaching students, but there's some that are reaching particular pockets of students. Um, a lot of Chinese ministry, Chinese campus ministry. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the Lord is doing something fantastic. I know what the statistic is. It's a very large statistics be of um, expat community across the globe. So if you were to look at how many people are actually moving from their passport country to some other countries, like they're not just moving in terms of vacationing, they're moving in terms of relocating. The, the amount of people that are doing that are the size of at least one very large country. I don't know precisely what, it's in the millions, great millions of how many people are actually being nomadic and going all over the place. So that means that people are coming here as well, a lot of times in campus ministry, um, and there's opportunity to, to reach these people in countries that we can't get to with our U.S. passport, but they're coming here. So there is, there is powerful ministry on campuses for that regard. It's hard. It's hard because, you, for one, you have four years, <laughs> basically. Um, it takes a while to build the trust with them, and then all of a sudden, hey, I'm graduating, and, you know, they're gone. But uh, you don't know what the Lord will do with that work. There's also fantastic. I heard of this one a few years ago. Um, there is some ministry happening in Texas where they are going into prisons, um, not only preaching the gospel to inmates, but preaching the gospel to inmates who are there probably because of visa immigration issues and they're going in there and they're preaching the gospel to these people that when they get out will not be here in the states anymore they'll be deported to wherever their passport country is and they're discipling them as missionaries mobilizers in the prisons to go back to their country to preach the gospel so we don't serve a uncreative God who said, I've only got one little way to do this, and that's it. Yeah, the one little way is proclaim the gospel, but the means by which we can do that is tremendous. And the way God is laying it on people's hearts is just fantastic. There's, be creative. Proclaim the gospel, absolutely. Meet needs of people. But how you do it, there is almost an unlimited amount of ways to do it. And so it's, it's fantastic what God is doing in this world uh, in regards to the gospel going out.
So how? How do we go about doing this work? Let's read this next set of verses from Paul. Someone want to read that? Okay, so this is a um, pretty often quoted uh, passage. Um, Paul lays out these uh, questions that kind of build up, uh, build upon each other, right? If people are to be saved, because we heard in the previous verses that people call on the name of the Lord and they will be saved. But Paul says, if people are to be called on the name of the Lord, well, how does this transpire? Well, they need to believe, first question, right? And how are they to hear? Oh, sorry. And how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? So they need to hear to, in order to believe. Okay, well then how does this, how does hearing happen if nobody is saying anything to them, right? Or preaching? Well, they need someone to do that, right? Then how can they, uh, how, how can someone preach to them unless they are sent? to them. So the people I need to reach are over there. And so in order to preach to those people over there, I need to go to those people over there. So the point of Paul's, he's got, he lays out these kind of rhetorical questions of, okay, if the people believe in Jesus Christ, they're saved. Well, how's that going to happen? Well, they need to hear. And then someone needs to actually say something to them for them to hear. Oh, and somebody actually needs to go to them for them to hear. So uh, this is kind of the how behind missions is going. But how do we actually gain a heart for missions? So this can be actually a very long list of gaining a heart for missions. But one of the first, first things we can do is we can talk about the gospel. Just talk about the gospel. Breathe the gospel, speak the gospel, learn the gospel, read about the gospel, everything about the gospel. Um, the gospel is not just some sort of transactional message where, hey, I became a believer and the gospel is no longer needed for me. I believed and that's it. You might snicker, but there's a lot of people who think that. Um, but the gospel informs every part of our life, every single day of our life, every moment of our life. And so if we start talking about the gospel more and more and more, and if we know about the gospel and we can speak about the gospel, and I don't just mean we know a gospel presentation like going up to someone and saying, hey, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, how would you know that you, God would let you into his heaven? That's a standard question. Um, knowing gospel presentations like the Evangelism Explosion, the Romans Road, um, those various ones, they're good to have as a tool in your tool belt. To absolutely, they're good things. But that's not just strictly what I mean about knowing the gospel. Um, there's so much about the gospel that we should know and learn and grow in. Um, but how the good news of Jesus Christ impacts every part of our life every day of our lives um, and how that can relate to the people that we're engaged with. So talking about the gospel in the church um, really does a wonder in our own hearts and lays a good foundation for when you then talk about missions, it's not like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, it's the gospel. It's proclaiming the gospel. Yeah, I know what that means here. I know what that kind of means there. But it embeds, it allows the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts in tremendous ways if we are constantly talking about the gospel and breathing in the gospel. 
Uh, again, Andy Johnson says this, the best way to encourage your church and missions is to stop talking about missions for a time. Instead, talk more about the gospel. Um, if the gospel is the heart of missions, well, talking about it, certainly God will lay on our hearts about missions, about the need for taking the gospel to parts of the world that don't have access to this wonderful thing that we call the gospel. So that is one thing on how to do missions is to stop talking about missions, not that we will necessarily, but to emphasize the gospel, to, um, to value it, to love it, to share it. And then really what happens at that point is missions is only a matter of geography. That's all it really becomes. It's, we're all about the gospel. We know about sharing the gospel. We love sharing the gospel. We love the gospel itself. And missions is just a matter of geography. Don't tell any missions agency I said that. One other thing, too, that we can do is have a vision for missions. Um, fortunately, in this church, we do have that. We're aspiring to a strong vision for missions. But if your church does not have a vision for missions, um, well, you're doing your church a disservice. I think you really are. Um, do people have an understanding of the the darkness and brokenness in this entire world. Uh, they, do they, would they know that God has a desire for people to come to repentance beyond just Pennsylvania Dutch? Do people understand and realize that there are people dying every single day without the hope of Jesus Christ, without even knowing the name of Jesus Christ? He's not even a curse word in their vocabulary. They just don't know who he is. People need to understand and know that. Um, you're also doing a disservice to people growing up in the church. Let's say Gloria grows up in the church, and this church has no vision for missions, and she gets on her heart, I'm going to go to Congo and preach the gospel to those people. Pastor Dan, Pastor Larry, could you send me to Congo? Eh. Okay, well, it's not really something we're doing. Go talk to some agency, and we'll, we'll see you in a few years. Is that really serving Gloria well? It's not. It's not serving the people in your church well. Not only are we not giving them a vision for what God is doing in this world, but we're not discipling our people well who are going to come to us. The ones that we have invested in, the ones that we have uh, spent all that time in, in Sunday school, in children's church, in whatever else, we haven't served them well when we have no opportunity for them to live out the calling the Lord's laid on their heart. So that's why we need a vision for missions. Um, you know, agencies have a large part to play in missions, but they really didn't come about until about the 1700s. Um, so what was God doing for 1700 years prior to that? People were going, people went to places, they went as a result of the church sending them out. Now, th again, things have changed. The dynamics have changed in the world, and agencies do have a part to play. But the church has a very large part to play in the sending of missionaries because they are the ones who send. Um, they're the ones who disciple the people. They're the ones who are helping those people go to the places the Lord has laid on their heart. So a vision for missions is absolutely important. Um, experience in missions. And this is where we get to the good old term, short-term missions trips, which we are doing this year. But So this one can be a little tricky. Um, but short-term missions trips sometimes get a bad rap. Um, sometimes people don't do them right. But n numerous, numerous churches have short-term missions trips and I can't tell you how many missionaries have been called out to go long-term as a result of going on short-term trips. Um, 
Um, I can speak from personal experience. Michelle and I went on short-term mission trips and got a fire in our heart for what God was doing globally, and that's why we went, um, because God did something in our hearts during those short-term trips and called us to go to Czech Republic as a result. So short-term trips, experience and missions is critical. If you go to any missions agency and you saying, I want to serve for the next 20 years in missions, and you have zero cross-cultural experience, in other words, you've gone nowhere beyond where you've grown up, maybe to college somewhere, they're probably going to ask you to do a little bit more in terms of gaining experience. So short-term trips are a great way to see what the Lord is doing in your heart, and it will absolutely transform your vision for what God is doing in this world. Um, going beyond your own cultural, linguistic barriers. Uh, Short-term trips, we also want to make sure that we're not going with our agenda. The missionaries that are on the ground, we want to partner with. They know what the people are. When we're gone from a short-term trip, they're the ones who are still there. So we want to be partnering with them in that ministry. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've seen in just a short time we were in, in Czech, is people who would come and have their own agenda. They would come and say that we're here to share the gospel with as many people as we can, regardless of how they clumsily do it and forcefully do it. Uh, and so that basically they can go back home and say that we shared the gospel with 5,000 people and we had 100 people that said that sounds interesting. Um, it's not about statistics. It's not about those things. We want to partner with what the Lord is doing. Yes, we want to share the gospel in ways that we can, and hopefully the people that we're partnering with have that same vision and desire, but we're partnering with them because when we leave, they're the ones who are on the ground. Uh, I had another leader who was in Africa. She said that she will never let somebody come and just hold babies and orphans. Um, and her point was, is that they get all this super attention for a week, and then you leave. And now they have this like massive withdrawal that the people are no longer there to hold them and give them all this extra, extra love and attention. That's not to say we ignore orphan ministry, uh, but it's to say that we need to be mindful of what we are doing when we come um, and that we need to heed the culture that we're living in. We need to heed the, the people who are there on the ground and um, understand what they are doing. Did churches who were supporting you and Michelle, did they send short-term mission trips to, to you? And like you, were, you led them, or I just not sure how that worked. Yes. Yes, we, um, so one of the big ministries, two big ministries that we were involved in, so a lot of the churches that we worked in over there ran these family English camps in the summer uh, where they would teach English in the morning. In the afternoon, they had some fun activity. There would be a, a lesson usually pretty Bible-oriented lesson in the evening. So we would need uh, teams from the states to come to teach English, to engage and interact with the, the, the families throughout the day and then in the evening to be able to be there for discussion groups and stuff. So yeah, we, um, we had our, one of our churches come, I think on three of those English camps. And then we also ran sports camps so we had a strong connection with Push the Rock Sports Ministries, um, and they came and ran with us five baseball camps. Um, in our last three years of being there, we, were, we lived in an area where there was a baseball club, and um, my son was playing baseball. I was helping to coach, and I played softball for them. And so we had a connection with the club that we were trying to make some strong inroads with, and we had ran some camps, so yeah. Um, so yeah, they were always partnering with us and we appreciate it that they understood there was a partnership. It wasn't just, hey, we're coming in and sharing the gospel is whatever way we feel like we need to share the gospel. So that was, yeah, meaningful. Yes, yes, definitely meaningful. Um, discipleship. Um, now, why is this associated with missions? Well, it has to do with the gospel as well. 
does the church intentionally disciple people so that they know how and are discipling others? This is a, if you were to ask me, the biggest deficit in missions right now is that people are coming to missions agencies and saying, I want to go, and they have never discipled anyone. Now, they were involved in Bible studies here and there and small groups, and certainly they're speaking the gospel to people, but not in an intentional manner, that they've never understood how to take someone who is a brand new believer and walk with them in various ways to see them become a disciple maker themselves or seeing someone come to faith through sharing the gospel and then discipling them through. Uh, it is a huge, huge deficit in the church. So how can you send someone who has never done it here to go to a culture that is completely foreign to them and a language that's completely foreign to them and share the gospel with people there and disciple someone there if they don't know how to do it in their own culture? So this is a huge, huge, huge deficit in the church. Um, and something that uh, I think is really how to do missions is that we disciple people here so that they know how to disciple and that they're able to take that to the culture that they're going into, um, walking side by side with people. The agencies can, can train someone up on how to cross a culture. They're very good at that. Agencies can train you up on how to learn a foreign language. They're very good at that. Agencies can help you understand family dynamics and things like that on living overseas. They're very good at that. Agencies can talk to you about church planting and disciple making, but they're gonna talk about it in a cross-cultural setting. If you don't know how to do it here, it's very difficult to figure out how to do it there. So that's why I say intentionally discipling people. If people are learning and know how to do it here, yeah, it's hard to do it there, don't get me wrong, but if you're knowing how to do it here, you can transfer some of those principles and skills to there. So two of the things that don't look like missions, focusing in on the gospel and disciple making, huge, huge pieces of how to do missions. Everything else becomes geography. It really does. It really does. Um, any thoughts on that? Because we're going to take a little bit of a break before we dive into um, what we're trying to aspire to here at our church. We'll probably be done a little bit early today. I'm sure you won't mind with the heat and everything, so... All right, let's take a 10-minute break. Let's get back together around quarter after, and then we'll continue on from there. Uh, bring this thing home so if in case anyone was interested our uh, resident statistician did a uh, quick look and the amount of people that are constantly on the go that are nomadic in this world is it was estimated at 66.2 million which is roughly the size of Great Britain so imagine all of Great Britain roaming around this world at one time so that's a lot of people that are basically expats from their country of origin. All right, so what this means for us as a church, this is our vision statement for missions. Hot off the press, if you will. As we build a culture of missions in the church, we pray that more will desire to be trained and equipped in missions, and ultimately exhorted to go out as long-term missionaries, all to the glory of God. That is our vision, our mission statement, if you will, as a church for missions. Um, 
It fits in line a little bit with our overall vision statement as a church. In part, it says, our vision is to be a church that regularly develops leaders and releases them for gospel ministry, both in the church and around the world. So last time that we were together, we talked about gospel ministry in the church and around us here um, in church planting and local uh, multiplication methods. And now we've been talking today about taking that around the world. So this is all in line with uh, what we as a church have been aspiring to do since even before day one of starting as a um, starting meeting as a church. So some of the things that we are hoping to do to borrow, if you will, part of our terminology that we use typically here as a church of engage, equip, exhort. Um, this engage an aspect of our church is more engaging the body. Um, as, a, as a church, when we talk about engaging, we talk about engaging the world around us with the gospel and sharing Christ. Uh, when I'm talking about it in the context of missions, the engage aspect is more how we engage our body, those in the church, in missions. So it's all about the engage aspect of our vision for missions is about building a culture of missions, building a culture of missions. Uh, and how will we do that? We're going to accomplish that in several means. Short-term mission trips. Um, it is our desire not only just for this year, but for other years to be able to engage in short-term trips, however that might look like. It may not always be Jamaica. It might be, uh, yeah, it might be Thailand. I don't know. It's not very short-term, but yes. <laughs> Trust me from experience. Um, but short-term trips, anything basically two weeks, three weeks a month, whatever, can be considered short-term trips. Um, so short-term trips is going to be an aspect of our engaging our culture. So getting people acclimated and understanding that part of the DNA of this church is that we go on these trips to, cross -cult to engage cross-culturally with the church globally and to engage our people cross-culturally with what the Lord is doing in this world. Um, and that will hopefully build a culture of missions in the church. Um, we also want our missions focus to be, here's a new term for you, UUPG. Anyone want to venture a guess what that means? Very close. Very close. Unengaged and unreached people groups. Unengaged basically means that they're unreached, but there's nobody engaging with that group right now. Um, so they're, our focus, this is not to the exclusion. Please don't get me wrong. This is not to the exclusion that if God should call somebody in our church to work with disciple makers in Kutztown or should and raise up somebody to go to Spain, that's not unreached. We're not going to sit here and say, well, we don't do that. Tough luck, go somewhere else and get money from them or support from them. But this is to say, as a church, this is what we want to communicate to the church. This is what we want to try to focus in on and our, uh, our support uh, spiritually, prayerfully, financially. We want to try to engage in with the unengaged, unreached people groups, those 17,000 or so groups in the world that are unreached. And if we could tackle one of them, two of them, as a church over the next 20, 30 years, that's fantastic. We don't have to do all 17,000. We don't have the resources for that. <laughs> we are, not even Paul could do that, okay? Not even Paul could do that. But the Holy Spirit can. So we want to focus in on those particular groups. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but we are currently, as a church, already uh, supporting missionaries that are working among the unreached people groups. So we are 
supporting. We have been for about a year. They are working in a unreached people group in the Indonesian area of the world. Uh, and that work is actually pretty far along. Um, I don't know if you remember them coming about a year and a half, a year or so ago. They came to our church and talked to us about that work. And um, they had been there for already about 10 years. And just at that point when they came back, the gospel was being shared with people and people were coming to Christ and wanting to be baptized. So that's how long this kind of work takes to get to the point where you can share. Because not only do you have to go, send people there to go, now they need to learn the language and then typically write the language down because it's never been written down because they probably are uh, an illiterate society. Uh, so you write it down, you learn the language, you write it down, then you need to teach the people to read and read their own language. Then you need to translate the gospel, parts of the Bible, the story of the gospel, the story of the Bible, to their language. Then teach them that. And now, by God's grace, see people come to Christ. That is a long, tedious effort. That's why, in part, some of these people are unreached because that work takes somebody who's doing more than a short-term mission trip. Uh, they are not there yet, but they will be going to an area of Thailand to uh, speak to a people, a group of people that are uh, within that 17,000, again, of unreached, uh, a very, very darkened, needy part of the world. Uh, we just actually came back from Thailand. Um, and yes, that country is very oppressive, darkened uh, by the falsity of Buddhism, primarily. So the much needed work to be done there and they are in it for the long haul because it will take a long haul. So those are two missionary families that we are supporting now uh, that fit within this UUPG framework. Uh, there are others that we have given uh, some support money to. Um, the people that we're partnering with in Jamaica, we've given some one-time money to them. There's also a family that has a connection with somebody from our church that is working in Congo. Uh, we have uh, supported a little bit there. So there's other work that we are supporting here and there. So it's not necessarily that it's just those two exclusively. But if we're going to put um, more effort in terms of financial support, spiritual support, prayer support, church support, it's going to be within the UUPG uh, arena, if you will. Um, one of the other things, too, that we are doing a, um, a lot in engaging is communication. Uh, we want to communicate the needs to people. We want to get missions in front of people. We want to have prayer focuses in on uh, missions. And so people understand what we are doing in missions. People understand what missions is about. People understand uh, we're going on a short-term mission trip here or we're supporting these missionaries over here. We want to get communication driving out to people. And if I'm not mistaken, one person sitting among us has asked or has stated that they are willing to be that communications team lead for us. Uh, Anna has stated that she is going to do that. What, we, what that is all about, we're still trying to figure it out completely, but um, we're starting to form kind of a missions committee, if you will, not in a classical sense, but kind of in the sense of these divided teams, if you will, communications and such. So. This is a huge part of our engaging the body to building a culture of missions in the church. So through short-term trips, focusing on a part of the world, um, people groups of the world, as well as communicating that to the congregation. In step with our ease, equipping. So the purpose here is training the church in missions. So not only 
we do we want to communicate to people what God is doing in this world um, and engaging the, the body with it, but we want to equip them. So short-term missions can be equipping them as well in uh, training the, the body and missions, uh, but also um, equipping, well, I kind of already mentioned it, prayer, um, equipping people in prayer for missions, um, having prayer focuses um, on a prayer and praise night for missions, having prayer uh, in, right now you probably notice that every Sunday we pray for a part, a nation in this world that's in the persecuted, one of the top 50 persecuted nations for Christianity, uh, and often like North Korea, Afghanistan, Pakistan, parts of Africa, etc. Perhaps in the future we will uh, shift some focus to parts of the world where we have a connection or affinity, uh, perhaps where some of our missionaries are working, uh, but having a prayer focus for parts of those world, those specific people groups in this world. So we want to have a lot of time focusing on equipping the body in prayer. Prayer is huge. Do you know you don't need a passport to pray for people in Afghanistan? You can actually get the Holy Spirit's well, the Holy Spirit is working in Afghanistan. He's working in all parts of this world. But you don't need a passport to pray for people of this world. And so we want to be able to pray for people, equipping uh, the body in prayer for missions in this world. One of the other thing, too, is training. Uh, there are various things that we can do in terms of offering up training for our body. Uh, there are... Things like Secret Church. We did that as a church this past year. Um, and they not only have an emphasis for Secret Church in regards to intense Bible learning, but they're also focusing on a country of the world to allow those who are attending Secret Church to be able to understand this is, this is an area of the world that's persecuted. Why are they persecuted? What's going on? What is God doing in that part of the world? So that we can be trained as a body, in more of what God is doing in this world. Um, one of the other things we can do is there's a course called uh, the Missions Course. It's a scaled, scaled-down version of what's called Perspectives. Uh, missions, the Missions Course is like a six-week course of, I believe, like maybe two hours a night uh, where you can do it live or you can do it through video uh, where... People come in, we talk about an aspect of missions, and we, and there's an aspect of talking about it. So it's a bit more intense kind of training, but it's, it's good to kind of get people acclimated to what is going on in the world about missions. Um, and one of the more classical, much more intense uh, venues for training in missions is called Perspectives, Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, something like that. Um, but that is, you can actually take that course for college credit, um, or you can take it for just kind of layman, non-credit, uh, but it is very intense in terms of uh, weekly, uh, for several hours uh, each week. There's a lot of reading ahead of time. Uh, there's a lot of, um, again, if you take it for college credit, you can get take paper. Did you take it for college credit? Do you have to write papers? Yeah. So it is a, it is a, a huge thing that the Lord has been using to train up people in missions, to get a heart for missions, what God is doing in this world. Um, it's being used across the globe. I know of a, a missionary who was in charge of perspectives in Brazil, and he, um, he saw lots of people come through that, and God is raising up thousands and thousands of Brazilians to go to nations in this world. And a lot of it was stemmed through what he was doing through perspectives. So um, I tell you, missions agencies that see perspectives on someone's resume, if you will, is, is always a good thing. It means that they've gone through some specific, intense, intentional training in missions. Now, this it does not mean that you have to be interested in going overseas to go through perspectives. It's just an eye-opener to be able to understand what is God doing in this world, 
what does the Bible say about missions? What is God doing in this world of missions? And missions agencies come off into these and talk about what God is doing in the world through their agencies. So um, if you go on to, I forget what it is, perspectives.org or something like that, um, you can see where local training events are happening for it. So this is a very big piece of training, of training is perspectives. And of course, uh, should the Lord provide us with people in our church that are looking to go somewhere, uh, even if it's a kind of a casual, I want to know more, I want to grow more. I don't want to do perspectives, but I want to do something. Um, I have already got tens of thousands of ideas in my head of how we can train people up in doing that. Um, I really, really would love to walk with people and some intense, it would be more intense, training, reading books, um, talking about, discussing things. But um, we would, that would be an aspect of our equipping, is equipping people for long-term work. So that is part of equip. Exhort. What are we doing here? This is actually sending the church to the world. This is where we would, as I mentioned, supporting missionaries. Uh, not only the ones that I had mentioned, but ones that would grow up in our church, sending them off into missions. And so we're exhorting them. We're sending them as a church into the world in missions, uh, supporting them, not just financially. That, that's a big piece of it. Yes, financial support is a big piece, but um, encouragement and prayer. Prayer is the thing that will sustain people long-term in missions. Yeah, finances are important, but prayer is more important. It is the fuel behind missions, prayer support. And then the other thing, too, is this might look a little new and different, is training national workers. So one of the things that we really would like to do is um, have kind of a, a different flavor of short-term missions is sending people from here who are equipped to teach to go to parts of the world where they are equipping national workers to be church planters, to go send, be sent out. And there are organizations that are doing this. We've been in contact with one in particular to that s focus specifically on what they call global training trips to send uh, leaders from the churches here in North America to go to, let's say, parts of Africa, Asia, to gather for a week together and to teach people in various aspects of doctrine and Bible for these national workers who don't have seminaries, who don't have all kinds of literature in their hands to train them up to go out to plant churches into their areas. So this is something that we're kind of really at the very beginning of, but there's a lot of organizations and opportunity for churches to engage with agencies who are doing these, this kind of work. And this is something that we really have a heart and passion to do because there's many people in this church who, who can teach the Bible to others and go. Um, not just men, but women. There's this one organization we're talking about has a, a track for, for women to go to train up women to be disciple makers in their contexts. Um, and so this is something that we really would love to see happen and, and do as an aspect of short-term missions, but with a focus of training national workers to go themselves to plant churches and to uh, share the gospel. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, our, what we aspire in missions here as a church. It seems like a lot, but we have a large vision, and however the Lord sees to implement that and work through us to do that, um, we will, we will patiently wait or we will frantically go along with him wherever he moves and however that happens and transpires. So any questions about what you see there for our vision, what we aspire as a church? Everybody here ready to go? Ready to be sent? Oh, I saw a shrug of the shoulder there, like, uh, maybe. <laughs>
fully me, whenever I see that interest, it has caught my eye. Again, it's, it's our desire to have a vision for missions because in case you haven't noticed, we have 30 to 40 kids running around every Sunday morning around here. And whatever we can do to have this foundation laid that perhaps 15 years from now, one of those kids comes to us and says, you know, I've gone on three of your short-term trips. The Lord has really laid on my heart to go somewhere in this world and help me figure that out. That's how it transpired actually for us is we didn't know where the Lord was leading us. Uh, we went on short, short-term trips. We came forward to our church and said, God's laid in our heart to go somewhere, but we have no idea where. And there was a single girl in our church who had the same desire, and she said, God's laid in my heart. You know for many years to go somewhere, but I don't know where. And as a church, we figured out what the Lord was doing and eventually landed in Czech Republic. So that would be a fantastic problem to have as a church is God's laid on our heart to go somewhere, but we don't know where. Can you help us figure it out? Um, Boy, I would love to do that. It gives me goosebumps. But uh, just to have this vision for missions, um, to have this vision for multiplication. We have a big vision for the church, really big vision for the church, for church planting, to not be a mega church, but to be sending people out to go and plant churches here locally um, and then abroad as missionaries, to send out missionaries. We don't know how the Lord will do that. We want to have that vision to lay it before him at his feet and say, this is what we desire and aspire to do. You take and do as you see fit. Um, thoughts, questions about anything we talked about today? I just to touch on why I think that kind of got my wheels turning. And, and you were talking about all of the kids in our church. And I wonder if there's a way we could somehow incorporate into the kids' curriculum, so, you know, something along the lines of, you know, we're, we're praying for particular nations every day. Obviously, that's, you know, that's not going to hold a six-year-old's attention span, but, but is, is there something we can do or resources that exist where just like a little, you know, a couple minutes, just kind of put it out there and go, but, but, but so, somehow incorporate these thoughts with our with our children's church yeah um excellent question i don't know a resource off the top of my head i'm sure there are uh, i think so one of the things we definitely need to continue to do is something i mentioned way back doesn't sound like missions but is talk about the gospel talk about the gospel talk about the gospel talk about the gospel um, and then missions just becomes geography um, talking about discipling. So as kids understanding, what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to talk to my friend at school about God? How does that live out in my life? Those are certainly things that actually play, lay the strong foundation for missions going forward. But to your point, to specifically talk about missions in conjunction with all that other stuff, yeah, there's probably some resources out there. I mean, I don't want to just say that we drop in there and, hey, we're going to talk about missions today in a Sunday school class, and then it becomes once a year, oh, yeah, i gotta, I got to hear about this talk about foreign missions. Um, but to make it kind of natural and part of the curriculum, that is, I think, bears more fruit than once a year we talk about things. But, yeah, excellent point. If anybody has ideas or thoughts or comes across something, let us know. Yeah. That are no longer living. I think it was one of your girls. I was helping one time when we were up at the Grange, and I don't even know who my teacher was I was working with, but she brought up this person's name, and right away the kids all knew who it was. And I'm like, but they knew the story. Who was William Carey? No, it was, I think it was a woman, but I don't remember. But I mean, the kids knew. The kids knew the name. The kids knew part of the story, and I found Five yeah, there's little missionary stories. Yeah. Anybody remember?
remember the old flannel graph and the old missionary books that you would swing through, like showing pictures and the story and stuff? There's some mission part in the curriculum. Oh, fantastic. We don't, we don't use it, but it's there. Okay. So okay. It's part of Good to know. It's part of the lesson. There's I think it's be. just time-wise. We don't, sure. we don't do that section. Sure. But it's there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Not like every they Sunday. highlight every lesson highlights like a different mission going on or a oh. different family doing something or Okay. Fantastic. Hmm. Just give you some resources. These are some books. There's far more than this. Well Sent is a book by um, Steve Byrne. He was a missions pastor for Calvary Church in Lancaster. A very, very, very large missions-minded church. He was actually on team's board for a number of years. Um, well Sent is a good book to show how a church can well send missionaries. Um, some of these other books, When Everything is Missions, I have that book here. This is uh, the book that will go through a lot of why we shouldn't call everything missions, why we shouldn't call everybody a missionary. It's a little technical, but um, it's, it's a good book if you want to read about missions from that perspective. Um, Let the Nations Be Glad. Um, this is a classic, classic, fantastic book. It, it's John Piper, so he gets a little, he gets in the weeds with Bible and doctrine a little bit, but um, fantastic book on missions. You cannot get much better than Let the Nations Be Glad. Um, this is the anniversary issue of it, so this book was written a number of years ago. Missions Affirmed, uh, again, looks at missions from the perspective of Paul and what missions meant uh, to him. Uh, that's another great book. Something Needs to Change uh, by David Platt. Uh, it's a very good book in the sense of um, he starts talking about uh, when he went on a short-term trip to Nepal and went to the, the hinter regions, if you will, of Nepal and to the mountainous areas and stuff and just saw all kinds of very darkened, darkened culture, but then also saw people that were living it up, walking for hours through treacherous areas to get to a church to hear about God. Um, so it talks about the fact that something needs to change in our churches to go to people in this world who don't have any access to the gospel. So something needs to change. It's a very, very good book uh, by David Platt. And then again, the, the class on perspectives, um, you can't go wrong with. If you want something much more intense, if you want something uh, that's going to really give you a broad overview of missions, perspectives.org is, yeah, you can't do can't do much worse than that, or much better than that. I guess it's a better way to say it. Um, any thoughts? Any questions? Can I ask for would one of you like to close your time in prayer, specifically about missions? If not, I can close. It's fine. I don't care about eloquence. It's the heart. Father, thank you for this time. This is my Redeemer family. Thank you for the leadership we have here that brings these lessons to us. Thank you for bringing to our attention the 17,000 plus groups of people that we need to add to our prayer list. Thank you, God, for letting us be a part of your creation.
what has been kind of a common thing that we've been doing is telling you what's next for REQ. Um, we're going to take a slightly different course with REQ. So typically we would do it every other month on a Saturday morning. What we're going to do is in the fall, in October, we're going to do five weeks of studying something together on a Sunday morning before church starts. So maybe that way we might have a broader audience. Maybe more people would want to attend. Um, maybe Saturday mornings prohibitive to some. So uh, we're hoping to do that. We would probably meet in the two rooms back there uh, where the children meet, but we'll try to do it as we don't have it all worked out, but we'll try to do it at a time. It's not prohibitive to the teachers wanting to get in there and, and do things. Uh, Trinity already knows that we would want to get in the building earlier, so that's okay. So just so you know, come October, that's probably what we're going to be doing rather than typically our schedule would mean that in September we would do another one of these on a Saturday morning, but that won't happen. So we'll have a five week kind of time together on a Sunday morning um, come October. So, all right. Thanks for coming out.